All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Lars Bilson, the director of the KITP, and I really uh, welcome all of you this evening. Uh, great to see such a great turnout. Uh, we wanted to go ahead and start five o'clock sharp. I wanna first thank all of our friends of KITP for all of uh, the support to the Institute, but also spreading the word, uh, letting everybody in the community know what's happening here at the Institute in terms of our outreach. Obviously we're 18 months into running things differently, uh, but I really want to thank all of the speakers tonight. And before we sort of launch into the program, I'd like to uh, have Mark Boick just say a few words about what's happening right now at the KITP. For those of you who are uh, curious to know how we're operating, Mark, over to you. Yes, good evening, everybody. So as you know, over the pandemic, we learned how to run a lot of online programs, something like 12 of them. Now, we are learning how to operate things in person and with a remote component. So we had a program over the summer on ecology and evolution. Right now we have two programs going on with people in the building masked. It's a program on what we call non-equilibrium universality and another one on energy and information transport. And they sort of merged because they're related and none of our European participants can get here at the moment unless you go through Mexico and quarantine for two weeks. Uh, and coming up, we're gonna have two exciting programs. So in the fall, um, we have an astrophysics program on transport and stars and a pretty interesting one on machine learning as applied to climate science. And we will have a public lecture in each of those areas. So stay tuned for that. And we are continuing to run programs at the forefront of scientific research for people all over the world that can get here or can get on Zoom. Back to uh, you, Lars. So thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks so much, Mark. It's definitely a challenging time. As Mark said, we Europeans still can't get in. So we're running at about half uh, capacity because our programs typically have half of our visitors from outside the U.S. So tonight we have this exciting new program called The Art of Doing Science. The main goal here is to allow for you, the audience, to get a little bit better insight about what it is to be doing science, the ups, the downs, the excitement. Uh, we'll see what these speakers this evening choose to share with us, but you'll, you'll learn some science, but we also hope you'll get a much better sense for what it is to do science. Uh, you usually get sort of the, the pat answer of everything's resolved and we know it and we understand it. And of course, uh, that's always true eventually, but we really want to share with you the excitement of getting to that point. So that's what we hope to do this evening. And we'll have more of these events as we proceed in different sub-disciplines within physics. Uh, so we really look forward to tonight's event. And I really want to thank all of the speakers for being willing to go on this great adventure with us and try something different. Our plan is to do all of these always on Zoom so we can get speakers from anywhere and get an audience that's quite broad. So the brief overview of what we're gonna to do tonight is we'll have roughly 30 minutes of a panel discussion with our three uh, uh, panelists who are here, speakers, uh, Leo, Jenny, and Monsi. And then we'll have 15 minutes after that of a Q&A and you can submit questions uh, via the Q&A or the chat, and then I will uh, be answering those, asking the panel to answer those questions at the end, and I will be merging questions and uh, deciding what which ones to bring up to the panel once I see what themes are emerging. So don't expect your question to be answered directly. Uh, some questions we may not be able to get to, but we'll just manage and see how much we can get through this evening. So I think we're I think we're in a good spot now where we're going to, uh, ah, Megan has sent something out, right. So Megan, do you wanna say briefly what you've highlighted? Yes, so if you'd like to get more information about KITP or events and invitations from us, please feel free to um, copy that link into your browser and subscribe to our email list. Uh, which is usually we get about, um, we send out about one email a month that's an update about KITP. And then whenever we do have a public event, we will send that invitation out to that list. So um, looking forward to getting some new uh, new faces in to our new KITP events. Thanks everyone for being here. 
Okay, so Megan, I think we're ready to roll the video and I'm going to give a brief introduction of what the topic is and then hand it right over to the panel. So on August 17, 2017, the astrophysical community detected a long sought signal, gravitational waves from the in spiral and merger of two neutron stars. Experimental physicists had spent decades building special purpose detectors for just such a signal, and all three, two in the US and one in Europe, um, heard the event forever after referred to as GW170817. That's the date of the event. With the duration of about 100 seconds, these ripples in space-time were caused by the in-spiral of two neutron stars, the dense remnants of stars left behind from massive stars. So these neutron stars with the mass of the sun and a radius of only 10 kilometers eventually came into contact when they were orbiting each other a thousand times a second creating a dramatic splash that you're going to see again in this artistic rendering. This is not real data. You'll hear about the data. Uh, merging these two objects at nearly the speed of light led to observable emissions in the electromagnetic spectrum, e.g. light. Some, like gamma rays, were nearly immediately observed, while others were slower and occurred in infrared and optical light that could be captured by ground-based telescopes that were alerted to which part of the sky to look at via clever triangulation done by the gravitational wave detection. That work identified the home galaxy of this merger about 130 million light years away. These events have been hypothesized as the place where many elements heavier than iron were made. And as you'll hear tonight, evidence of this nucleosynthesis is now rather clear. So I'm really excited to hand this story over to our panel. Leo Singer is a scientist at NASA and was part of the team which detected these space-time ripples. Monsi Kazaliwal is a professor at Caltech and used telescopes from around the world to detect the glow from the collision that we now call a kilonova. And Jenny Barnes is a postdoc here at KITP who made many of the fundamental theoretical predictions of the afterglow from the radioactive elements forged in this cataclysm. So Jenny, take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Lars. Um, yeah, so as Lars said, this had been, you know, a signal the community had been waiting for for a really long time. Um, but I didn't necessarily, I think, have a sense of how deep that history went when I first started working on these because, um, let's see, I started grad school in 2010 and kind of random walked my way into you know, this field of astrophysics and into thinking about multi-messenger astronomy. Um, and actually the first project that my then advisor, Dan Kaysen, suggested I work on was thinking about these neutron star mergers, which, you know, I had heard of neutron stars, didn't realize they would merge, um, but kind of started digging into it and realizing, you know, or learning that um, one of the very interesting things about these neutron stars merging is that we think that they um, pretty uniquely in the whole universe create the right conditions to make a lot of the elements that are heavier than iron. So these are things like, you know, gold and platinum and uranium and kind of all of these exciting elements. But of course, the question is, um, if we were lucky enough to see this kind of merger, what kind of signals could we look for in the light that was generated that would let us know for sure that this hypothesis was right. And so that's where I started focusing my efforts. Like if you do have this really special kind of nucleosynthesis, um, what about the signal, you know, what about the signal would, would kind of prove that theory? Um, yeah, and I think one of the, you know, the, the first work I did uh, on this actually suggested that you would get a really different kind of glow, right? So. Um, astrophysical transients shine in different colors and, you know, there are kind of typical colors that are associated with like supernovae or other familiar transients. Um, and we actually made a prediction that the, the light from this kilonova generated when the two neutron stars merged would be very distinct and it would actually, there would be a lot of red light coming out um, and even light, you know, at wavelengths that are outside the visible spectrum. So we would need like specialized instruments to detect it. Um, and so we made this prediction and we kind of understood, you know, that it was very cool because this would be a smoking gun. We don't know a lot of things that emit this, this copious amount of red light that we were predicting. So 
you know, on the one hand, we said this is really exciting. We potentially had a smoking gun. It could be big. On, on the other hand, we were thinking, okay, when will we get a chance to test this theory? You know, the problem with studying multi-messenger astrophysics before you have um, a fully functioning gravitational wave detector network is it's really hard to get a handle on how many of these events you expect. You know, we just didn't, we didn't really have a lot to inform our baseline expectations. So it was like this tension between, on the one hand, a ton of excitement over thinking that we'd found something that could be really, really helpful in proving a very old theory. Um, and then also not knowing how long we would have to wait in order to, to see whether we were right or, you know, how far off we were. Um, so it was like a really kind of exciting time, but then, but then also just, you know, going into a potentially really long period of, um, of uncertainty and just having to wait and see. So, and I imagine, you know, Leo, you were on the gravitational wave side of things. So part of a long, a really long history of building and improving these detectors and just iterating and getting better every time. Um, yeah, I don't know if your experience of waiting for the first event was similar or different, or if you'd like to tell us about kind of how you got involved and, and what it was like leading up to that. Yeah. So the random walk that you described that brought you into this field, I had a, also a very random way of finding myself working on gravitational waves. And I, I, when I went to graduate school, I originally wanted to do something very different. I actually, I, I, I don't. I doubt even Lars knows that I originally was wanted to go to UC Santa Barbara to work on a dark matter experiment. So, it complete, fundamental physics, completely different kind of science. Um, and when I was uh, touring schools, I I just for a lark um, decided to get a tour of LIGO Laboratory at Caltech. And um, by the time I, the tour was over, I knew what I was going to to do with the rest of my career because it was just so exciting and the, the people that I met there were so wonderful. Um, so gravitational waves were um, go back a long way. Um, Einstein predicted them in 1914 uh, as a consequence of his theory of general relativity. These are ripples in space time that are um, basically a, a consequence of um, uh, the fact that the influence of gravity travels at the speed of light. And so uh, space-time doesn't respond immediately when a massive object moves. Um, and Einstein uh, was actually, you know, wrote that gravitational waves were so weak that they would, even if they were real, no one would ever be able to detect them. Um, so the... Uh, LIGO detectors have a history that goes back um, almost 50 years to the 1960s. Um, uh, the, the NSF uh, finally decided to fund LIGO in the 80s and 90s, and it got built and did. It, it had done a couple observing runs um, by the time that I started graduate school. But um, when, I joined, when I joined LIGO, my PhD advisor, Alan Weinstein, said, you, your class is so lucky because you are going to be the ones that finally see the first detection of gravitational waves. You're, this is going to be something that you get to uh, claim as something that you studied in your PhD thesis. That didn't happen. The first detection of gravitational waves was uh, several years after I after I left graduate school and went to, went to work at NASA. Um, but um, yeah, so my, what I worked on and what I work on and work on now in LIGO is that triangulation. So we have these, uh, three, um, gravitational wave detectors all around the world. There, there are these, uh, amazing, uh, high powered laser interferometers. Imagine a, you know, an L shaped pair of, uh, bunkers containing a uh, high vacuum and a high powered laser sitting off in the desert. Um, so uh, we use techniques that are basically very, you know, triangulation, very similar to sonar or radar. 
um, to figure out where sources of gravitational waves come from. And I figured out how to do that um, very quickly in a matter of seconds. And that's, that was important for being able to point telescopes. Um, another connection with, uh, with the Kavli Institute is that um, I became a sort of part-time astronomer as well as a consequence of um, a Kavli Institute workshop and some connections that I made there. Um, and I, um, uh, I spent about half of my PhD also doing um, optical astronomy to look for gamma ray bursts, which at the time we were treating as sort of a dress rehearsal for how we would need to be able to tile the large localization regions that we get from LIGO, um, but that but, but certain types of gamma ray bursts are also uh, signatures of these uh, you know, of these mergers and these uh, R process nucleosynthesis events in their own right. Um, but that you know that sort of uh, dual life, that sort of day job of uh, LIGO data analysis and night job of optical astronomy, which by the way I was uh, uh, lucky enough to work with Monsi on while. I was a graduate student and she was a postdoc, um, uh, was also a really interesting experience. Um, Actually, sorry, now that we're talking about optical astronomy, uh, it feels like a good time to check in with Mansi. And, you know, I'm kind of interested to, to hear how you decided to, you know, pursue the EM follow-up side of things. Yeah, so I think, you know, even before 1707, uh, there's a decade in the making. Jenny at, you know, ITP at one of the conferences that Lars organized was telling us this is going to be really red um, and paid very quickly. Okay, so red is tough, paid quickly is tough. And then Leo was telling us from all these beautiful calculations that we can tell you where it is going to be, but that where is going to be anywhere in like a hundred or a thousand square degrees. And that's a huge piece of the sky. So it's giving us a clue, but it's the third level of stuff. It's not going to be an easy game. Um, yet we were, uh, we were not uh, um, easy to sh get shy away from this problem. And fortune favors the prepared even more than the brave. Um, so we started preparing for this, um, uh, this one fine day moment, right? And it's not clear when or where, when it would happen. And uh, so I set up, uh, I put a proposal into the National Science Foundation for a partnership in international research and education, which involved eight different countries, 17 different um, universities. Um, it was somewhat of a crazy idea that we're going to sort of make this relay race network of observatories around the world so that we can stay in the dark. And uh, so if Jenny was right, and this thing's gonna fade very quickly, then we'll need telescopes, not just on one mountain top, but on many, many mountain tops around the world. So we can actually take advantage of jet lag and the rotation of the earth and keep staying in the dark. So this network that NSF graciously funded, even though it was an extremely risky idea, and when we proposed it, it was before gravitational waves were even detected. So to go out there and say, okay, not only are we going to get detect gravitational waves, we'll also detect the light from it. And Jenny's going to be right. And it's going to fade really quick. <laughs> so we need this network of telescopes. Um, it was a little bit crazy, but somehow the National Science Foundation was okay with that and liked our proposal and gave us funding for five years to build this network that we called GROWTH. Um, so growth stands for Global Relay of Observatories Watching Transients Happen. And we were just preparing, preparing, preparing. We were trying to overcome every dimension of this challenge of, um, of what Lars described in the beginning. And uh, you know, for that August 17th, 2017 moment, maybe Leo, you can take us back to that morning. <laughs> that changed at least my life. Probably yours too and Jenny's too. I think all of our lives. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, there there are some some rough memories. Um, so I was in so many different time zones on August seventeenth. I think I I don't I I had a bunch of conferences that I had to go to. So that's a so so that's another thing. Science is one of one of the real perks of, of being a scientist is that you 
get to go to conferences and you get to give talks and you get to travel a lot. Um, and um, uh, so I don't, I don't even remember where I was starting from, but it wasn't from home in DC. Um, but I, I think that I got the alert while I was flying to um, uh, Montana State University for um, an extreme gravity workshop there. And um, I, um, no, I, I'm sorry, no, that was 59.14, the other famous gravitational wave event. That was the one that happened on a plane. Um, no, th this one, the alert happened. Hey, Leo, while... do you want to tell people the difference between 1509.14 and 1708.17? Oh yeah, 1509.14. So the, the, that, that number is the date, 2015, September 14. So that was the first ever detect, direct detection of gravitational waves. And they were from a pair of black holes that merged. And that is the detection for which um, uh, uh, um, Kip Thorne, um, Ray Weiss, and Barry Barish won the Nobel Prize. Um, but crucially for us, since black holes don't have any matter, you know, they can't expel any matter and burn these heavy elements. So there was, you know, nothing for Monsi to look for in that event, no way to test my theories. Um, so very important for the GW side of things, but like not quite the multi-messenger event that um, those of us on the astronomy side were, were still waiting for at that point. That's right. It, it, we practiced, it was a bit of a dress rehearsal just yeah. to, you know, keep our wheels greased there. Yeah. Um, no, so GW 17 was two years later, and um, that was the first discovery of a neutron uh, of a neutron star merger. So first direct, I, I mean, uh, and it was the first uh, time that we'd ever seen an electromagnetic counterpart of a gravitational wave source. Um, so uh, the alert happened during this extreme gravity workshop. And I think that I was actually on stage in a panel discussion with uh, sitting next to Wen Fei Fong, who's um, a, a, another um, young scientist from our generation, um, who's uh, done a lot of uh, seminal work on gamma ray bursts. Um, but so I, I mentioned that I have this day job and this night job. And so that, that at times makes for... <laughs> Uh, that, that can be very challenging sometimes. So um, there were a bunch of problems with the, the LIGO data. There was a um, glitch in one of the two United States detectors. Um, actually, it was, um, so, so these detectors are affected by all kinds of uh, things that can go wrong. They can, there can be, like if, it's, if someone drives over a speed bump outside the detector, it'll create a glitch. Um, this was a, a photodiode saturation glitch, but it was basically the the, the worst, uh, most egregious data quality problem that we've ever um, looked at in um, data that we considered science quality. And then another problem was that the data from the Euro European detector, Virgo, um, wasn't transferred automatically because of a, a network glitch. So I was, so I was on call to um, help uh, manually process the the data and get a, get get a localization generated and because it's it's the it's the the, the, the software that the, the localization software that I wrote as a graduate student is what we use to generate sort of the quick look rapid localization that people use to point telescopes um, I had to run that manually and um, so there was at the conclusion of that process I had in front of me on my computer screen, the, I, I was the first person to see the localization of this event. I was the first human being who could name the constellation that it was in. Um, so as soon as we had finished that and got, gotten the alert sent out to uh, the astronomers, I then had to switch gears because, um, again, I've been, uh, uh, you know, I've been working with uh, Monsi's Project Palomar Transient Factory and now Zwicky Transient Facility for many, many years. At the time, uh, PTF was being upgraded to ZTF, so that wasn't online. But I, I was lucky enough to have a little bit of uh, time on Gemini, which is a, um, a very big, well, it's a pair of very big uh, telescopes uh, operated by the National Science Foundation um, that have a great suite of uh, optical and infrared instruments. And 
I was, um, I, I, I made, I was able to trigger that program on the first ever neutron star merger. I didn't, I, I and, and so I contributed one or two, you know, data points to the data set that, that, um, that, that we now have. Um, and I was. He was being modest there. I mean, I was <laughs> sitting next to him when he was observing but remotely, virtually by Zoom. We used Zoom yeah. long before yeah. the pandemic. And the Gemini data was getting downloaded. And it was the third galaxy on our list was NGC 4993. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I had Jenny's voice and Dan Casey's voice in my head, right? That this thing has to be red. And mm-hmm. somebody else had just reported that there's something blue in this galaxy. And the image downloaded literally minutes later. And Leo and I could look at it and point and be like, oh, my God, it also has a very bright infrared detection. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, most we've, we've done this practice so many times that so many times we get, you know, heartbreaks that we can't even count where we find, you know, another fast transient, another supernova, another massive star doing its thing, right? But we're not really two neutron stars forming that black hole. And when Leo and I were sitting at Gemini in that moment, I mean, I couldn't believe it, right? I mean, I, I would have bet the only sub blue light would just be another supernova, right? If supernova are beautiful, I mean, but they're just not as, not, not as beautiful as a kilonova here. Yeah. Because oh, that's but, forming a black hole. Go ahead, Leo. But the chaos wasn't <laughs> over because, um, so remember, I'm at this conference and um, I was, so, so there was a, a banquet afterward. Um, uh, I think it was Nico Yunus, who's a young professor there, had people over for like steak and wine. And it was uh, all, you know, very nice. But I, I had to go up until into their um, uh, nursery <laughs> to get away from the party because the Gemini data was just getting transferred. And so I was sitting there, you know, balancing a wine glass on my lap and, you know, reducing the data. And um, yeah, so it's just, you and know. It was, I mean, that was just the first few hours, right? I mean, what followed was actually, I mean, three weeks of, I think, no sleep or very little yeah. sleep or nonstop, uh, nonstop working through this ring of telescopes, right? So nothing is as easy as you had planned. So this thing happened to be really far south, really close to the sun. And it got so close to the sun that we actually had to stop observing after about three weeks. But in this three weeks, we were able to collect data from you know, 17 different telescopes around the world. And uh, actually, the world as a whole, there were 3,000 astronomers and the 77 telescopes around the world that, that contributed you know, essential photometric points. And each one really mattered because you know, during the night, Leo, me, many other, you know, observational astronomers would be staying up all night to try to trigger a telescope, collect some data, reduce the data. And then during the day in the afternoon, we would spend trying to put the pieces together. And one of the biggest mysteries for us was that the pieces just didn't fit together. I was ha- happening to have lunch with the theorist Udina Kar, who was visiting Caltech at that time. And I was supposed to meet with him for a completely different topic. But when I reached there for lunch, he could see through my face. He's like, what is wrong with you? Why are you so excited? Like you've you know, seen something you've never seen before. And I was like, no, that's exactly what happened. And the yeah, scene is believing. Think, sorry, Mansi, just to, um, just to pause. And then I want to get to the rest of the story. But I think one thing that we all know, but maybe we haven't said is, um, you know, this event was like secret for a while. Um, I think something like half of the astronomers in the world had some kind of connection to LIGO. So the whole astronomy community basically knew about it, but we still officially weren't supposed to talk about it. So there was also kind of, you know, like, um, Leo, I don't know what your experience of being at that party was, I'm sure you couldn't just say like, oh, sorry, everybody, the neutron star merger happened. I have to go download this Gemini data. You're just like, I have to do a thing. Um, But yeah, so there was also just this kind of, um, this balancing act of like trying to reach out to collaborators, get the best possible data, get the best possible explanation, but like without breaking these agreements that we all had not to totally spill the beans on this first of its kind event. Um, sorry, I just wanted to, to put that yeah, out there. Absolutely. Please That's exactly where I was going to go. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I remember when that those alerts were pr- private and I always had to be extremely careful because as a LIGO collaboration member and as actually at the time, I wasn't just a LIGO collaboration me- member. I was one of the co-chairs of the 
um, uh, e LIGO EM follow-up group that, that actually did the alert software and like was in, in charge of like science outreach to astronomers. So I had to be very careful to like stick to the rules and and um, and and be above board. And so yeah, I I mean I there was a lot of a lot of winking. <laughs> um, but I and and I think that I think that um, the hosts uh, of that meeting, uh, you know, they, they knew that something was on, was 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 going on because there were enough LIGO collaboration people at their conference that when they all bolted from the room simultaneously, they knew that they, 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 there was only a finite range of things that could be going on. And, and I'm sure the computer actually calls cell phones, right? We had set it up so that we don't waste any time, right? So the so everybody's cell phone rings in the group of collaboration, right? So literally, I mean, all there were all these people in the room whose phone started buzzing at exactly the same time. And no, it was not an earthquake alert. It was actually a neutron star merger alert. And they had to all go hiding in their different corners and try not to give away this, this big secret that it was so fun. I mean, the data for this event, which happened in our backyard, was, I mean, it lit up the entire electromagnetic spectrum. There was gamma rays, x-rays, radio, um, infrared, optical, ultraviolet. I mean, every single piece of the electromagnetic spectrum lit up. And putting these pieces together just was very confusing initially because Jenny has this beautiful blackboard behind her. Like We would spend the afternoons just working out different models on the, on the blackboard and throwing them in the trash can because... Well, the data that we just got last night didn't quite fit with the prediction of model A versus model B versus model C. And ultimately, we had to come up with an entirely new model to try to explain this thing. Um, the one part that worked was Jenny's prediction. That was spot on. <laughs> the, GR, the, the gravitational... GR was good, yeah. GR was pretty good, too. But the rest of it, right, how to explain the gamma rays out of a factor of 10,000 wimpier... Why did the radio take nine days? My, my radio colleagues agonized for nine days while the rest of us were, you know, in heaven because we had such amazing data to work with. But they, had, they waited for nine full days, which seemed like an eternity in, in that, at that time, for it to light up in the radio. Now, they had the last laugh because the radio then kept rising for more than a year after that, uh, while the rest of us were like, oh, it's too close to the sun, it's gone. But, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it was really an amazing experience to try to understand what this event was telling us. Yeah, so I guess now the question since, you know, 2017 is, like, where do we go from here? Um, you know, Mansi, as you alluded to, we got really lucky because this first event was really, really close. And so we were able to get all of this um, amazing data. And since then, we haven't really had a comparable event. Um, although I think some of that is, you know, the pandemic has posed some challenges for, for LIGO operations. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll certainly have another observing run soon and hopefully get some more data. Um, but yeah, I guess like after the initial excitement faded and which, and the initial excitement, you know, lasted at least a year, I would say like it's, it wasn't, you know, I don't mean to suggest that it was a really, um, you know, rapidly fading level of excitement, but, um, but yeah, I guess just what, you know, what is next? Are you focused on the next event? Do you think there's still more that we can learn from 170017 or, um, yeah, yeah we're... That, that, that's a great question, Jenny. And I mean, as um, as we just heard, right, I mean, 170817, this merger of two neutron stars synthesized half the elements in the periodic table heavier than iron. But this is a very large number of elements, right? I mean, this is elements with you know, atomic mass numbers between 80 and 200. That's like you know, 120 different elements there. And we still debate to this day, right? Did it make just, you know, the, the heavy elements, but not the heaviest of the heavy elements, right? I mean, how much of the gold and platinum and lanthanum and, and neodymium did it actually make, right? I mean, the heaviest yeah. of the heavy, maybe it made a tiny bit. I don't know, Jenny, whether they believe it was a tiny bit or not at all, but, but there's yeah, no debate, right? It's, um, yeah, and I think what Mansi is getting at is, you know, this, this nucleosynthesis process, because it makes so many different kinds of elements, um, well, there are just a lot of different ways that it can go. It's not a really straightforward process where, you know, it's um, kind of 
anytime you have it, you get the same outcome. It's really sensitive both to what the conditions are, when the elements start fusing, and then also to all of these, you know, the details of nuclear physics that we haven't fully worked out. So, you know, like what do nuclei look like when they get really heavy and really neutron rich and really far from stability? Um, and definitely, you know, it's it's not the only fundamental question we want to answer with neutron star mergers, uh, the origin of the heavy elements, but it's it's one of the fundamental questions. And and yeah, I think I guess that's one of the things I realized, like after the initial shock wore off of like, holy cow, we actually saw a neutron star merger. It looks at least a little bit like what we thought it would look like. It seems to kind of point in the direction that some of our hypotheses are right. And then you start digging into the details and you realize like, oh, there's still, there are still so many things we can't quite answer. Like even with this event that was, as you said, right in our backyard, um, even with all of this like amazing high quality data, um, you know, there are still, there are still just like uh, and, questions we don't have answered. Right. And to me, like the next big thing is the neutron star black hole mergers, right? I mean, We've seen black holes merge. They don't create, create very much light unless they're super heavy, but that's a topic for another day. And we've seen two neutron stars merge, but now we're starting to see single neutron stars, single black hole merge. And the question is, you know, do they light up the electromagnetic spectrum in the same way? And do they agree with Jenny's predictions for the heaviest of the heavy elements or not, right? I mean, what do, what does that look like? And I think for that, um, going redder is something that's prudent because, um, as you know, the, the modeling shows, it's, it's probably something that's even redder. So I've been busy trying to build a fleet of infrared telescopes, infrared surveyors, um, at Palomar Observatory and hopefully even in Antarctica, if, if, we, if I get the funding, <laughs> uh, to build very, very sensitive infrared telescopes. Uh, to detect not just light from neutron, neutron star and neutron star mergers, but even light from neutron star black hole mergers. And, I, and you know, maybe, um, yeah, Jenny, you could tell us what you, what you would predict for that. Or... Oh, sure. Yeah, I guess I think, um, again, like I talked about, the kind of nucleosynthesis you can get depends on what kind of conditions you have when these elements start fusing. Um, and if you smash two neutron stars together, there's, you know, a lot of energy that's released uh, in that collision, and that can um, produce particles that are going to irradiate the gas as it's flowing out and starting to do its nucleosynthesis. Um, and that can affect the final pattern of elements that you get out. So in particular, it, it generally speaking, makes it harder to make these heaviest of the heavy elements, which are kind of the, the holy grail of astrophysical nucleosynthesis. Like, where do these come from? Um, if instead you have a neutron star black hole, you don't actually have, you know, this um, collision. What you have is a neutron star just kind of getting shredded by a black hole, um, leaving some of its mass outside the black hole's event horizon, and then a lot of it is going to get swallowed by the black hole. But because you don't have this violent collision releasing this energy, you take away some of these processes that we think makes it harder to do this heavy element uh, synthesis. And so, yeah, you might get um, like a more robust pattern of nucleosynthesis and it might, it might look very different. Um, or yeah, I mean, it might look uh, like maybe an extreme kilonova is the way to say it. Like take away the blue part, double down on the red part, um, but either, I mean, it would just be very interesting to see, I think, when you, in, in some ways, that's like the simplest possible system. What happens if you just rip apart a neutron star, take away the collision and all of the messiness that comes with that collision, what kind of light do you get out? So actually, I wanted to ask Leo, like, when do I get my neutron star black hole merger? You already have two. There will be two three. There will be a bunch more, I'm sure. What the, I, I, I don't know how long it will be until we detect... Um, optical or, or infrared from them. But I was going to say that, um, you know, for the next five years or so, I think that um, ultraviolet is where it's at. So, um, so I mean, if, if people remember from earlier, uh, you know, Jenny was explaining how, like, she, she'd figured, she, she and her, her collaborators had figured out that um, no, these these uh, these mergers wouldn't create all this optical light. They'd be producing a lot, all this infrared. You know, it'd be a lot dimmer. And so that turned, you know, you know, two 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 or three decades of, um, you know, on, on its head about what we were supposed to be looking for. And people changed their, 
you know, strategies and what types of telescopes and what instruments they were using completely. And that, you know, that did turn out to be correct and prescient. But on the other hand, 1708-17 also had at very early times this um, very blue component, even ultraviolet component that we don't understand really at all. We have some ideas. Um, I mean, we think that, you know, maybe the, the merger could be, there, there could be, it, it, it could have like a, like a, like a disc component and then a more, you know, isotropic spherical component. And those two components will have different temperatures and velocities, or it could be that you have this um, jet that's, you know, trying to escape at almost light speed. And as it plows through the exploding uh, neutron star junk, it causes it to puff up a little bit and, and glow. Um, but we don't really know. And so um, uh, actually, you know, Monty and I are both, we're, we're working on two different uh, space missions that are going to be uh, um, uh, fault, uh, looking for this ultraviolet signature. One is um, uh, supposed to, one is um, uh, called Dorado and it's, um, it, fingers crossed if, it's, if it gets approved, going to fly in around 2025. The other one is called UVEX and it's uh, will fly a little a few years after that if it, if it gets if it gets approved, um, but that's that's like the very very uh, short term. Uh, I think in the next ten to twenty years, there's there's going to be a lot to to look forward to in in this field. So um, we're already thinking about building sort of the next generation of gravitational wave detectors on the ground. So there's um, uh, the LIGO detectors have four kilometer longs. There's long arms. There's one in, um, there, there's a, there's a U.S. concept for one that's 10 times longer. There's a European concept for one that's, uh, almost 10 times longer and is 300 meters underground. And with these, these sorts of detectors, we'll be able to see all of the binary black hole mergers in the universe because we will be able to see so far, so, so far away in distance and so far back in time that we, we can go as far back as there are stars. And the reason that's wild is because there are those who think that dark matter is made of primordial black holes, or at least some dark matter is primordial black holes. And if we can see far enough back that we know that there aren't any stars, uh, you know, at you know that that at such 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 a distant time in the past, then any binary black hole mergers that we detect are primordial black holes that were um, that that are that were formed from uh, from the Big Bang. Um, and there is we're, we're also um, in the 2030s. We hope that we'll be launching um, a gravitational wave mission in space called LISA which is uh, three spacecraft flying in formation, um, uh, tumbling through this equilateral triangle in an orbit around the sun behind the Earth. Um, though Lisa is going to detect mergers of supermassive black holes from uh, you know, mergers of, ga of distant galaxies. It's going to detect um, uh, gravitational waves from uh, white dwarf binaries. And, you know, any day now, we Crazy also... Crazy dreams do come true, right, yeah. Leo? <laughs> so, right. Yeah. so this is, a, I think, a wonderful, a wonderful place for me to start bringing in some questions. We've got um, 17 great questions here. So I'm going to start off, uh, Monsi. There are a few questions about um, arrival time of different parts of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum. So I think... Uh, it would be good to just to say a little bit very briefly about about you know order of arrival for as we understand it ha doesn't have to do with does not have to do with different speeds of light the speeds of light for all these are the same but sure very yeah, happy though. to take happy to take that one yeah. so we at seven on august 17th 2017 at 417 utc that's when we actually saw the two neutron stars merge and the gravitational waves Two seconds later, 1.8 seconds to be precise, two seconds later, we saw the gamma rays light up. And then about 10 hours later, mostly because of the rotation of the Earth being really super slow, I wish the Earth rotated faster. Um, we saw the uh, optical and the uh, infrared emission. 17 hours later, we saw the ultraviolet. 
So basically the first day or so you can think about ultraviolet and optical emission. Infrared then lasted for a few weeks. And then we had to wait a full nine days for the X-ray and the radio emission. And that was not because of lack of looking, it was because what we were seeing was the mildly relativistic um, jet breakout that took a long time to interact with the interstellar medium. And the radio and the x-rays then lasted for hundreds of days afterwards, after the ninth day long painful wait. That's great. So Jenny, a, a question for you. People are trying to understand how these elements get made. So I think, we, I think they'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, how the ejected material makes the elements. Sure. So I spend most of my time also trying to understand how these elements get made. Um, so I'm right there with you, everybody. Uh, okay, right. So we've been dancing around a little bit more technical terms, but the name of the game here is our process nucleosynthesis. Um, the R stands for rapid neutron capture. So like you have probably heard at some point that a lot of elements are made in stars um, and that's made through like ordinary fusion. So if you have, uh, you know, a nucleus of an atom and another nucleus, you can just smash them together and make a bigger nucleus. Um, but as your nuclei get heavier and heavier, eventually this smashing stops being effective and you get to a point where like, it doesn't matter how hard you smash them together, they're not interested in forming a new nucleus through that channel. Um, so rapid neutron capture, which, which is what we need to make, you know, these, a lot of these elements, well, neutron capture, we need to make elements heavier than iron. Um, it can be slower fast. But what that refers to is instead of taking two fully formed nuclei and, you know, combining them, um, you start with just one nucleus and you hit it with neutrons. So, right, a nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. Protons have positive charge. Neutrons are neutral. Um, so instead of, you know, kind of taking these big jumps and, you know, two small building blocks become one large nucleus, what you're doing is incrementally building up, um, incrementally building up your, the, your nucleus. So you're just adding neutrons. It's getting heavier and heavier. Um, the weird thing about that, well, there are a couple of weird things. One is, you know, neutrons are unstable. So a free neutron will decay into a proton. Um, if you put a neutron in a nucleus, it becomes stable, but only up to a point. So, you know, like helium has two protons and two neutrons, and it can just sit that way forever. Um, but if you kept adding neutrons to that helium atom, like eventually it's not going to like it anymore. Some of them are going to turn into protons. And then of course you have a different number of protons in your nucleus and you actually have a different chemical species. Um, so what happens in the R process is you have very rapid and energetic bombardment of these free nuclei by neutrons. And so you build up these very heavy, very neutron rich species. Um, eventually you run out of neutrons, so you stop making, you know, you stop actively adding to your nuclei, but you have these unstable, uh, yeah, these unstable nuclei, and so the extra neutrons are going to turn into protons and kind of, you know, adjust until they, they reach stability. Um, and that is how you make heavy elements via rapid neutron capture. Um, so from a nuclear physics perspective, this has actually been understood for about 70 years. I think the paper introducing the idea was um, Burbage, Burbage, how I always get this wrong, Hoyle and Fowler, not um, Howler and Boyle. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tongue twister for me. Um, so right. What's that? Those would be Harry Potter characters. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, so the the neutron or the, the basic nuclear physics has been known for a long time. The problem is that because these free neutrons are unstable, it's really hard to think of an environment where you just have a lot of them around that are available, you know, for the for the building up of heavy nuclei. And so that is, I think, one of the key insights. Um, that Jim Lammer and David Schramm had back in the 70s was you have the right conditions in a neutron star merger or a neutron star black hole merger, you can actually tear apart the neutron star. Um, and then, you know, once you, once you take neutron star material away from like this 
the strong gravity that characterizes the neutron star, it's going to expand. That's going to be pretty exothermic. So it like puffs up and you get a lot of free neutrons and it turns out you really naturally produce the conditions that you need to have all of these free neutrons uh, just colliding with these seed nuclei to get this incremental, um, this, incre this yeah, successive neutron capture and incremental buildup of heavy nuclei. Sorry, that was kind of long, but that's, that's, uh, that's great. That's more great. or less how it happens. So, so Leo, I've got a question. Leo, I have a question for you. Um, what do we think was left behind from the two neutron star mergers? What, what's still there, and how do we know? Oh well, probably a black hole. But I mean, oh boy. Um, you can say so, I don't know. That's that's fine. Yeah. This. Um, so so. I think I think actually months might be better to answer this one because uh, the, the a lot of the clues are really um, buried in the um, in in the electromagnetic signature. Um, but um, we can we, we you know we really don't. I mean we we can measure very accurately the masses of the neutron stars that merged. And so we can accurately predict the mass of the final compact object. But the problem is that we don't know what is the maximum mass of a neutron star um, because we don't know what's called the neutron star equation of state, um, which um, uh, is, you know, you can convert into something that in, into a mass radius relation that tells you for a given uh, neutron star, if I know its mass, um, how how big is it? Um, and um, uh, yeah, I I mean so um, that that's fine, Leo. That's yeah. fine. No, that's yeah. fine. You, uh, another quick question for you, Leo. What programming language did you use? Python C. Your triangulation. Software. Python C. Yeah. Python. Okay, that that was good. Okay, I thought I'd get that one out of the way. Yep. <laughs> Um, we've got a fair amount of questions about black hole and event horizons and things like that. Um, so I'm not sure yet. I'm, I'm trying to still see if there's a, a question I could frame out of that that would be uh, an easy one. Uh, maybe, maybe Leo, I have you on the line right now. Can you say a little bit about the computational side of the gravitational wave piece? I think that's a big part of what happened, but we haven't really said anything. Maybe, maybe you could say something. Yeah. So um, there are sort of two kinds of analysis that we have to do. We first have to detect the sources, and then we have to um, estimate the you know the physical properties. So to detect them, we use a technique called matched filtering, which was invented. Um, uh, you know, many decades before LIGO and, and has its roots in, um, in radio um, and radar. Um, but it basically means that we, so, so the data, but the LIGO data, by the way, um, it's kind of neat. It's, it's gravitational wave strain. Um, so it's this weird thing that like almost sounds like science fiction, but what, the, the way we rec record it is as a time series and the sampling rate is 16 kilohertz. So it's, it's like, it's like audio band signals. So you can play back, you, you can, you can um, if you clean the data a little bit, bit and you can play it back, there, there are gravitational wave signals that you can actually hear. Um, and certainly the, 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 two famous, the two really famous detections are among those. Um, so um, match filtering, you have, a, you have the signal and you have a, a model for the signal and you just slide the model along and see where it matches up best. Um, what makes it computationally expensive is that we have to have uh, many, many template signals, uh, one for each possible uh, mass one, mass two, spin one, spin two. And, and so we build these, these template banks of hundreds of thousands or millions of signals. Um, and then when we go to do the parameter estimation, um, that's also very computationally expensive because we have to do this Random walk um, throughout the parameter space um, to to make sure that we've we've uh, tried all of the possibilities. And so we have um, 
so, so LIGO has three uh, very large computing clusters, one at Caltech um, and one at each of the United States observatories. Um, they each have something like, uh, my, this might be a little out of date, but last I checked, they were like, I think 5,000 machines, probably uh, 10 or 20 cores a piece. So, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of cores. Um, yeah, and, it's, and it's, if I may <laughs> add just one quick thing to that, um, I mean, the challenge for the gravitation wave astronomers is much worse than a needle in a haystack because they're looking for one tiny part, one tiny change in one part in 10 to the 22. It's, more, more, it's less like a needle in a haystack and more like a grain of sand on a beach or something like that. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right oh, analogy. But I, I forgot to very, mention. Yeah, yeah you, you, can, you can hear some of these signals, but you can't see them in the data. So like if you just plot the signal, there's nothing to see. And the only way... Except for except for those the, the the those two very special, very famous, very loud ones. The only way that you have a prayer of detecting it is using match filtering. Okay, so in the last minute or two, I would just love to hear from Monsi and Jenny about what do they really hope happens when LIGO turns back on, which is coming soon. Monty. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well done. Okay, Jenny. Oh, well, it's hard to follow Monty's great answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would hope for the same. Uh, I would also hope, as we've been talking about, for uh, some new kinds of events, um, like some neutron star black hole mergers with strong electromagnetic signals, just so we can kind of complete, you know, our survey of the, the different kinds of um, merging binaries that we can have. Okay, Leo, Leo, when does LIGO turn back on? Uh, this summer or fall. Okay, so we should tell 20. the audience to stay tuned <laughs> for this summer or fall? Sorry, summer or fall. Right? Uh, is it, it is this, I'm uh, sorry, next summer or fall. Wow. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. 22. All right, so one year away. Okay, well, very exciting. I want to thank all of you for a wonderful event. This really worked, and I know it wasn't easy because there's it's hard to do the body language inter interrupt thing on Zoom, but I think we were able to do it. So obviously, you've all three worked together and are able to see where you're going and the discussion. So I really want to thank all of you for that. Um, and I think at this point, I just really want to thank everybody for coming and remind everyone that this is, uh, well, there we go. Thank you, Megan. Uh, to connect with us, there's a subscribe here to future events. Uh, also, Megan, I believe the uh, talk, if people missed it or want to send it to family and friends, it's going to be available where? That's right. It will be available on um, the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics YouTube page, which I've also linked in the chat. Um, and that will likely be uploaded next month. And uh, you can also get a link to that if you subscribe to our monthly outreach updates, which usually come the first Wednesday of every month. Okay. I don't think we have anything else. Thank you, Jenny, Monsi, and Leo. And, you know, wait a year and let's see what happens. So, but, you know, I did get a call saying we can't be needed to organize a program. So there was one leak from your tight ship system uh, <laughs> back in the day. So KHB was able to do a program because I was given enough information to let me know it was a real deal. So that was an exciting phone call to get. So thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Right. So much fun. Thanks.